What about vitamin D, fish oil supplementation, magnesium? We hear a lot about those in the low carb community. All of those three are things that my patients frequently end up on. Um, the only supplement I take is magnesium because people I follow and respect in this field say that's an important one that in our, in our modern agricultural practices our soils are deplete of magnesium. And also if I occasionally will get some night cramps uh, and that's something which classically um, it responds to magnesium. So it's the only supplement I personally take um, and uh, yeah. Probably worth talking about vitamin D for a moment. So there's been a lot of data over the years saying that we've got terribly low vitamin D levels and it's a wonder supplement. If you take it, it'll do amazing things for you. And the reason people thought this, and when I say people, doctors like me, is that when you have a look at the population levels, the people with the lowest level of vitamin D in the population die at a significantly higher rate than people with the highest level of vitamin D in their body. Now, we know that you get vitamin D from the sun, but the idea was that you don't need to get it from the sun, you just take the tablet and that will bring you up to that same level of health protection. Well, guess what? It doesn't. So, if you get high levels of vitamin D from tablets, it helps out with other things in your health, with bone health and several other things, but the effect on all-cause mortality, your chance of falling off the perch, is not significantly altered. And the reason that I think is this, is that it's a concept of a surrogate marker. Vitamin D from the sun is an indication that you're getting something else from the sun, and that something else relates to nitric oxide. We know that in summer, blood pressure in the population is lower, and that rate of heart attacks is lower than in winter when people aren't exposed to as much sun. And there's very good evidence. I was reading a dermatology journal several years ago, and I came across this, and I don't know why it's not been more widely promulgated, but they were able to demonstrate that UV exposure on the skin led to these beneficial effects on heart health through nitric oxide production. So I suspect that vitamin D is acting as a surrogate marker for this other pathway that's going on, and that's where we get a lot of the benefit from sun exposure. So without encouraging people to go burn themselves in the sun, how much sun exposure would you recommend? So, this topic, I'll do a lecture on it one day because it does get more complex. We've got several different types of UV rays, and they get filtered out of the atmosphere um, at different times, depending on how much atmosphere they go through. For instance, UVA um, doesn't really get attenuated in the atmosphere. So early in the morning, when the sun's low in the sky and you've got a very long shadow, you're getting quite a good dose of UVA, but the UVB, which is commonly thought to burn the skin, is being filtered out. And come noon, when the sun's passing through less of that atmosphere, the ratio of UVA and UVB that you're getting is actually quite different. So the, how much sun should you get is a really complex answer, and I don't think the science is fully in, but I will say I'm quite light-skinned, and I like to get my sun, but I make sure that my shadow is at least as tall as I am. And that gives me a good proxy that the sun is passing through enough atmosphere that the UVB rays that are going to burn me are being filtered out, and I'm hopefully getting some benefit from the UVA rays with nitric oxide production. And what about fish oil supplementation? We know that there's different quality fish oils. Would you like to comment on that, Rob? Well, as I had suggested, there is some value in fish oil in the rheumatic disease, particularly with rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, particularly with rheumatoid arthritis. The question is how much? And, uh, and this is where there is some debate. And it seems to affect the outcomes in the inflammatory rheumatic disease, we need a lot. And we tend to uh, have a figure that we use, which is 2.7 grams per day. And so that uh, does require uh, you to have a look at the packaging in order to be able to uh, work out how much DHA and EPA is in each capsule to ensure that you're getting at least 2.7 grams a day. But I think uh, where we're going now is probably more looking at the ratio, as has been discussed already this morning. And I think our understanding and our education about omega-6 and how we can better um, adjust how much omega-6 we're getting in our diet might also help to require less amounts of omega-3s, which I understand some people can find is a bit difficult to tolerate, uh, as some uh, experience in GI upset and so forth, some gastrointestinal upset with having to uh, consume so much fish oil. 
But it'll be interesting to hear what the other guys have got to say. Well, again, just from a surgical perspective, we do have to be a little bit, a little bit careful because uh, fish oils can um, increase your bleeding. And so we make sure patients stop the fish oils at least three days, hopefully seven days before we operate on them. So, you know, if you're someone that has a bleeding tendency already, or uh, you, you know, ladies with heavy menstrual periods, these sort of things, you just have to be very careful how much fish oil you take because it does have other side effects. It's not all completely beneficial for you. Well, thank you for that, Ron, because you've just closed out my lecture. I just realised now I forgot to uh, discuss the link between aspirin and vegetable oil. <laughs> so uh, you would notice from that omega-3 pathway that one of the uh, pathways led down to some, an enzyme called thromboxane A2, which leads to the production of uh, some uh, sorry, uh, chemicals which increase the risk of clotting. So reducing the omega-6 and increasing the omega-3 actually makes the blood thinner, if you will. And that's exactly what Duran's just mentioned with his surgical patients. If you're running a very high omega-3 and a low omega-6, then your bleeding tendency, which is normally good because it means you're not going to get those thromboses forming in the heart and the brain, <coughs> causing a stroke and a heart attack, means that when, you know, somebody like him cuts you open, it means you're a bit more leaky. <laughs>